Okay, welcome viewers and uh, a very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, I am the uh, project coordinator and curator of uh, the Regional Science Center and Planetarium Calicut. You all know that uh, even though our center right now is uh, not allowed to go for public programs uh, with uh, uh, physical presence uh, of the people here, but it is our continual effort to uh, engage with all with the message of science uh, with the pandemic be it related to the pandemic or otherwise and uh, we felt that uh, during this pandemic period while definitely we should talk about uh, the pandemic and its uh, associated issues at the same time we also tried to look towards uh, other happenings in science because uh, they are also important and uh, we were trying to connect to people with the messages of science from different streams and different cutting edge ideas uh, one of them is here today and we are very lucky and fortunate to uh, have a very prominent scientist among us uh, dr arun kumar pati from one of the uh, most esteemed institutions uh, in India. It is the Harishchandra Research Institute. Uh, Dr. Pati is a professor there. And I'll just uh, give a very small introduction to Dr. Pati, though probably those who are into this field of quantum computing, they know him quite well. He is an internationally renowned scientist. Uh, professor Arun Kumar Pati is internationally known for his work in area of uh, uh, information quantum information theory quantum computation general quantum theory and foundations of quantum theory quantum information and computation is a promising field you all know and it is a research field where active researches are going on um, all over the world and india is no exception and uh, professor pati's work has been represented on the cover page of nature uh, his uh, he has become uh, he has captured the headlines, news headlines quite often. Uh, I remember that I first saw uh, news about him probably somewhere in 2006 or seven, And uh, from then onwards, quite frequently, he has fared in uh, many of uh, these uh, newspapers, uh, media, but in the professional circle, he has been a very, very well-known and renowned uh, professor of this particular subject. Now you all know those who are students of physics uh, that uh, quantum mechanics creates uh, some kind of intrigue and uh, uh, Professor Pati is an expert uh, on explaining all such things. We'll have a chat probably afterwards. But before that, uh, I hand it over to Professor Pati for his today's deliberation, quantum computing and quantum information technology. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us. And uh, it's all yours. Okay, thank okay. you uh, for a nice introduction. Uh, so today I'm going to tell about uh, this exciting uh, field of quantum computing and quantum information technology and uh, I will try to give a flavor of uh, you know uh, recent advances over last 20 years or so uh, so hopefully you know this will be motivating for the young generation so as you see, myself uh, at HRI Alhabad, and we have here one of the largest group in India in this field. So, uh, can I go to next slide? Okay, so what I'm going to do today, I will tell briefly about quantum computing, quantum communication, and uh, quantum cryptography, and what is this field about quantum uh, information technology and what is the future of this quantum information and uh, finally i will try to summarize what i you know what i have uh, told during this talk okay so next one please so all of you know uh, that when you deal with the classical information processing devices we know that all the time we manipulate a string of bits okay when you Think of string of bits. Essentially, you store your information, you know, in bits, which is the basic unit of information, like zero or one. So, what is zero or one? Essentially, it means that you identify two 
physical state of a classical system and you say okay if it is say on it is zero if it is off it is one or anything you can think of and that will constitute a uh, you know you can encode a single bit using that physical system and uh, and then you can do various tasks according to your uh, desire according to your goal and so on using classical laws of physics when i say classical laws of physics what i mean i mean essentially you use your newton's law or your maxwell's equation and so on in describing the physical process but what happens is you never find you know uh, these classical bits in combination of these logical states that is if you deal with classical information you will never find your logical bit which is both zero and one okay be either zero or one but that changes when you go to quantum uh, domain okay so next one please next slide so when you think of a computation i mean we have seen tremendous progress over uh, uh, last several decades uh, starting from uh, you know uh, early computer era to even uh, desktop to laptop even you know to mobile and so on but essentially it is a device where you have a string of input a string of bits at the input and there is a uh, processor which processes information and then you get the output so typically your computer is something essentially input you process and then you get some output okay this is the simplest way to imagine a computer okay next one please and when you think of a communication essentially you have two person ellis and bob or could be sender could be receiver and then you have to send information through some channel and uh, that is your communication channel it could be face to face it could be internet could be telephone or could be you know email could be uh, fax anything you can think of and then receiver will receive the information and then he will he or she will um, decode the message and if they want to do back and forth communication again he or she can encode and send it back to the other person and so on so this will constitute a communication cycle okay typically this is what happens when you think of uh, classical communication okay next so uh before uh 80s people have been thinking about uh, this information science and physics you know they were thinking that maybe they are two different uh, you know different topics you know they are not connected but it is a great insight due to rolf landauer one of the pioneer of uh, classical reversible computation he realized that any computation is essentially a physical phenomenon happening in a physical system so once you realize that physics and information they are not really disparate not really different subject they are intimately connected and that led to a profound insight uh, what is captured here essentially he said that information is physical and that leads to this view so called physics of computation and this has so much impact on the uh, you know um, in the late 90s that uh, people like charles bennett and many others tried to uh, think of reversible logic at reversible computation and ultimately that led to imagine or led to think uh, you know that opened the door towards also quantum computation so this played a very important role i still continuing to play a major role uh, you know in trying to understand uh, uh quantum information and uh, its connection to physical system and all of you will agree that physics is deeply involved in fundamental work which ultimately leads to various technological developments you can cite many examples starting from computers to internet to electronic devices to communication systems and recently this emerging technology what i'm going to tell today about so called this quantum information technology okay next so so coming to this uh, quantum computing you may wonder how this field started you know how did this field or who initiated this field so essentially it is due to uh richard feynman's insight who started to realize that if you have to simulate a complex quantum complex uh, physical system on a classical computer that will be very very inefficient so then he realized maybe if you exploit quantum uh, system maybe uh, it can simulate more efficiently but he didn't didn't have any clue uh, how to 
question for them. So, but this question was very important at the time in 1982. So he raised this question, what can happen if you store information in two distinct set of a quantum object? And this uh, insight was taken forward by the British physicist called David Dyes, uh, who actually uh, laid the whole foundation of quantum computing. So he, in some sense, is the father of quantum computing. So David Dyes, in 1985, he realized that not only you can store information in a uh, distinct state of physical uh, quantum system, but also you have this so-called quantum mechanical superposition principle. And once you have that, what will happen is that not only you can store information in zero or one, but also you can store information in zero and one. Okay, this is a new possibility that emerges naturally, you know, when you think of uh, quantum systems. And uh, essentially he realized that quantum computers are devices which uh, you can build using the principles of quantum theory, the ultimate theory of nature. As I said, this idea is originally due to David Dyce, and this came in 1985, and subsequently in 1989 also, he wrote another paper. So these two papers in 85 and 89 uh, actually constitute two major uh, developments in quantum computing. I mean, the, the, the founding pillar of quantum computing. Okay, next one, please. So, so here is a citation. Uh, uh, from Royal Society of London when he was uh, awarded this fellow of Royal Society. That citation uh, goes something like this. So David Dyes laid the foundation of quantum theory computation and has subsequently made or participated in many of the most important advances in the field, including the discovery of the first quantum algorithm, the theory of quantum logic gates, and the quantum computation and network, the first quantum error cor cor uh, correction scheme, and several fundamental quantum Universality result. So, as you can see, I mean, his uh, his uh, results really span a, a you know a wide variety of things in quantum computing, starting from the initial uh, proposal of building quantum computer to uh, quantum algorithm, quantum error correction. So many things he actually did. So he really remarkable what he did. Okay, next. So there is another motivation coming uh, due to Morris law, which says that number of transistors on a chip doubles every 24 months. And this has been a guiding principle for high-tech industry since it was coined by Intel co-founder Warren Moore in 1965. A decade ago, you could find that chips were built around 500 nanometer level. And a uh, few uh, years back, uh, IBM announced to build chips at seven nanometer, maybe it is also trying to reduce even, uh, you know, the scale. So in future, they may even build it at much smaller scale. Next. So this is the figure that you see when you think of this uh, Morris law. So number of transistors essentially uh, goes like this. And if you extrapolate by 2030, uh, you will see that transistor will need to be about two nanometer that is essentially four atomic distance. So which means we know that once you go to the atomic scale, your conventional classical physics will break down because you cannot apply Newton's law, you cannot apply uh, Maxwell's equation and so on. So we have to use quantum physics to store and process information. And that is another reason, this is, this is not the only reason, but one of the early motivation was, was also to see whether you can uh, bring quantum effects uh, by going down to atomic scale. Okay, next. So let me tell you essentially what this quantum bit is, what do you mean by a quantum bit? So as I said, a classical bit you can find in zero or one, but because of this quantum superposition, uh, you will find that a quantum object can remain both in zero and one. So what it means? It means that think of a, uh, single electron, okay? So electron has a spin, it is spin up or spin down. So if it is spin up, you say it is zero. If it is spin down, you say it is one. But then we know that uh, an electron can also remain in a linear combination of this alpha up and plus beta down. That is because of this, uh, you know, wave particle duality, which we are all familiar in our graduate uh, level course. Um, 
quantum object also you know they satisfy this uh, strange uh, feature that is they can also remain simultaneously in both up and down which means if you translate this uh, physical state to logical state it means that you have a state where your logic is both the logical state is both zero and one okay so this observation is the first demarcation that you see when you go from a classical bit to a quantum bit okay and you can think of also photon polarization you can think of atomic level you can think of uh, ionic level and so on so any two distinct quantum state once you identify you can say okay one that will be zero other should be, will be one but then at the same time you can also have a situation where you can design your quantum state to be both in zero and one and that inherent parallelism is responsible for the new type of computation that will you know give right to whole field of quantum computing essentially okay next one so here is a pictorial way of looking at that what i said so so you identify two straight up and down, but then by superposition principle, you could have a situation where you can have alpha up plus beta down. But <clears throat> but if you want to do a measurement on a quantum system, that is, if you want to read the uh, you know result of your computation, you do a measurement, and that will essentially end up again up and down. So you can again end up only with zero or one okay so even though your quantum bit can exist both in zero and one but to be able to extract some possible outcome you know which could be a result of your computation essentially you do a measurement and that will end up either zero or one so if you're dealing with many many quantum state or quantum bit again you will end up with a string of bits string of outcomes like zero like up, down, down, up, and so on. So that means essentially you have to convert to classical information. <clears throat> Next one. So if you think of a situation where you handle with two quantum bit, then you see what happens. So we know that two classical bit can remain in one of these four logical states, like 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. But if you think of a quantum bit, they can also remain simultaneously in all these four logical states because of this called quantum superposition next so if you now imagine n quantum bit you see what happens so compared to classical scenario where n bit can be in one of those two to the n possible logical state this quantum computer which is consisting of n quantum bit they will be able to have a logical state which will be a superposition of all those exponential number of logical state. So you see the number of state that a quantum computer is able to assess is exponentially large, you know, in number of qubits. So that is the power, you know, which people realize in early days of this, uh, you know, and uh, that's where this exciting thing, you know, excitement uh, happened and then this whole field emerged. So as you can see, if you think of a situation where you deal with n, so 300 number of quantum bit that goes something like 10 to the 90 which is more than the number of atoms in the known universe so you see how large how vast this uh, exponential number of logical state is and quantum computer essentially take the advantage of this exponential number of logical state which often we call as massive parallelism because you are able to assess parallelly both the logical state okay or in case of n qubit you are able to assess Parallelly, all this exponential number of states. That is why you say it is massive parallelism, which is offered by uh, you know this quantum theory. Okay, next. So you can ask, what can you do with quantum computer? Okay, so this is the one of the most important question uh, that people have been uh, wondering about. So technological revolution from compu quantum computer may allow to solve problems that are currently too complex for classical com supercomputer. So in early days, uh, there have been few algorithms, algorithms like uh, a source algorithm, which you can use for factorization. There was this Grover's algorithm, which you can do uh, for database search. And there was this dash Joja algorithm that was designed to decide nature of this function, which was essentially to 
to highlight uh, you know how quantum computer can be more uh, efficient more powerful compared to classical computer next one so building a quantum computer is the race of the 21st century which is a difficult and ambitious challenge and it has potential to revolutionize future computer that can do impossible calculation with the plethora of useful applications in healthcare even defense sector finance chemistry and even material design or development software debugging aerospace and even transport and the speed and power of quantum computer lie in the fact that the quantum system can remain in multiple quantum states that only occurs at the quantum level and we need to bring quantum computing to commercial reality and we need a strategic team to put the effort and that is why you see a lot uh, you know three to five years a lot of private uh, companies lot of uh, uh, you know academic institute lot of uh, government uh, are actually putting investing a lot of money in this area to build a quantum computer okay next one so already we see a global race for building quantum computer so for example in 2016 ibm initiated to build commercially available universal quantum computing system with 5 qubit in may 2017 ibm q was announced a prototype commercial processor with 17 qubit and that has significant improvement compared to what it was uh, so it was most powerful computer at that time and last uh, year in september 2020 ibm announced a 65 qubit quantum computing processor and by 2021 they plan to have 127 number of qubit and by 2022 they want to build about 433 number of qubit and in next 10 years sorry uh, in next uh, Two years, they want to go about building eleven hundred twenty-one number of qubits. Next one. So once they build this, they want to have uh, you know so that uh, everyone can use. For example, you can have uh, you can allow. developers you can allow programmers and researchers to implement quantum algorithms and other information processing protocols and uh, already we see that there are more than more than 30 companies have already started investing in quantum computing and quantum information technology and you might have seen in news item uh, last year uh, in fact also last last year that google achieved so called quantum supremacy and what is that supremacy essentially it is a uh, it is a terminology that you reserve for this that is if your quantum computer can solve a problem that no classical computer can solve in any feasible amount of time irrespective of the usefulness of the problem that is whether your uh, task is useful for social societal benefit or something else don't care but at least if you can claim that yes your quantum computing processor can actually solve much faster compared to all the existing supercomputer then you will say okay you have achieved quantum supremacy and also there is something called quantum advantage which essentially uh is the following that if you can demonstrate that the quantum computer can solve a problem faster than classical computer um then you will say that it is achieved some advantage okay next one So you said in in 2013 Google uh, claimed this quantum supremacy with this processor, uh, and that had about uh, 54 number of qubit. The task they implemented was something uh, essentially to, to check the random number generation, uh, which a best supercomputer can will take about 10,000 years, but with this Sycamore processor they could do. only in 200 seconds so you see uh, the the imaging power of uh, this quantum processor you know this effect uh, number of qubit uh, last year uh, in 2020 december this chinese team uh, they tried to design another processor which is 10 billion times faster than google's processor so it took about 200 second for edge 
world's hot supercomputer might take approximately 2.5 billion years to carry out the same task, which essentially brings out a clear example of quantum supremacy. Next one. So, so when you think of quantum computing, quantum information, often you will see or you will, uh, you know, read some article where they talk about quantum entanglement. So what is that? So entanglement essentially is a strange kind of uh, feature that happens whenever you deal with two or more number of particles. Okay. So essentially what happens is if there are two particles which are in an entangled state, then it is not possible for you to associate a definite state for an individual system. That means individual quantum states are not independent. They are linked in the strongest possible way, even if they are far apart. That means if you prepare two entangled uh, particles in your lab and you send one particle to, say, Delhi, other particle to, say, you know, to New York, as long as you can maintain their entanglement, they will behave as if a single entity. Okay, so this is the miracle of quantum entanglement. And this, the weirdest feature that you see in quantum world, and that allows you to do many imaging tasks which are otherwise impossible. And I will try to highlight some of the tasks which uh, you will see in next couple of uh, slides. Okay, next. So quantum entanglement essentially involves entwining two or more particles without physical contact. And this provides an invisible kind of link between two or more particles, which you can use for quantum communication. Next. So uh, you may be surprised to know that entanglement is one of the hot uh, topics now. I mean, now means over the last 20, 20, 20, 20, 25 years or so. But it was already discovered way back in 1935 by Schrodinger and later on, in, not later on, in the same year actually, by Einstein and Podolsky Rosen in trying to uh, argue that quantum theory may be not a complete theory. Because, you know, uh, if, you, if you read the history of quantum uh, mechanics, we know that Einstein was not really very happy the way quantum theory was being developed because uh, unlike uh, classical world, quantum theory brought some kind of indeterminacy, some kind of probabilistic element, which was very, very, uh, you know, uncomfortable for Einstein. So he thought that maybe quantum theory is not a complete theory. There is something beyond quantum theory. So he used this entangled state to argue against quantum theory. So, so he, he, along with his colleagues, they found that entangled state displays strong correlation between space like separate particles. And this spooky action, uh, which they called, in which according to them was very strange, but now we can exploit for quantum computation and quantum communication. Next one. Okay, so thinking about quantum information uh, and quantum bit, there is something even uh, remarkable about these quantum bits because they are in some sense private. Because once you store information in quantum bit, nobody else, <coughs> sorry, nobody else in the world can know what information is actually stored in this quantum bit. So, so in that sense, the information stored in quantum bit, they're private, okay? So there are some uh, results that uh, uh, were proved in 1982, like so-called uh, no cloning theorem, which says that quantum information cannot be copied, which essentially means that given a, quantum bit, if you have stored some information in that quantum bit, only you can make a copy. Nobody else in the world, nobody else in the whole universe can make a copy of this information. And uh, later on in 2000, we also discovered something called no deleting theorem that we say that quantum information cannot be deleted. And uh, in 1999, uh, there is something called no flipping that you cannot flip an unknown quantum bit. Like classical information you can make a not get like zero can flip to one, one can flip to zero, but quantum bit, you cannot flip. Next one. And also in 2007, we discovered something called no hiding theorem, 
which was trying to uh, explain the issue of information loss. Okay, so typically, when we encounter some physical process, physical system, and if we see that information is lost, uh, we may ask the question: What happens to that information? Is it really lost, or it has gone to, uh, you know, uh, some some somewhere else? And uh, what, is, what is actually going on? So you can show that information is not actually lost, but it moves to some other system, and that essentially proves the conservation of quantum information. And that was also tested uh, using NMR's quantum computing setup. Uh, in IAC in 2011. And very recently, we tried to prove something called no masking theorem, which essentially tells that uh, if you want to store information uh, not on the physical body, but only in the quantum correlation, so called spooky correlation, so that locally, this person, Alice and Bob, they will not be able to see the information. That means as if you, are put, you put a mask on this uh, local uh, entity so that you don't see their face, okay? You don't see the information, but it is globally, it is there. Is it possible? And we found that that is not possible all the time. Sometimes you can do, but not all the time. And these results have deep implication in quantum information and quantum communication. Okay, next one. So if you ask uh, the question, what is going on in quantum information? What is the big goal, a big picture? Essentially, here, in two lines, I said what I what typically we explore in this area. So one of the main goal in quantum information science is how well we can store, process, and transport information uh, contained in a quantum state using principles principles of quantum mechanics. Okay, that is one of the big goal. And in in uh, this uh, exploration, essentially we use these features like supervision, entanglement, quantum non-locality, and we exploit these features for particular applications and for doing imaging tasks which are impossible otherwise. Otherwise, it means in classical world, you cannot do uh, those tasks because in classical world, you don't see these kind of features essentially. OK, next one. So here is a scenario where you think of a quantum communication channel. So quantum communication essentially means you send quantum information using rules of quantum theory and using some quantum and classical resource, okay? So here you see two person, Alice and Bob, and Alice and Bob, they have to, before starting the protocol, they have to establish some kind of quantum channel, which means they have to distribute some entangled state beforehand. And what they can do locally within their lab is anything that is allowed uh, within quantum mechanics, okay? Don't worry about uh, what I said here, unitary measurement. If you don't know, I mean, don't worry, uh, because for this you need a little more uh, understanding about quantum mechanics, but uh, don't worry too much about this. Essentially, Alice will do something uh, to her particle, you know, which is allowed, which is physically possible, you know, which means that should be that particular operation that Alice is going to do, should be uh, allowed by quantum theory. That's all, okay, that's all you need. And then depending what she does, she will communicate over classical channel. As I told in the beginning, classical channel could be, could be internet, could be telephone, could be, could be, you know, uh, fax message, anything you can think of. And depending on that message, Alice, sorry, Bob will also do something and at the end, they will achieve the task of doing quantum communication. Okay, next one. So coming to quantum communication, you see many, I mean, you will see many developments, but I am not going to tell all the details. So so, uh, so I have highlighted a few things here, like quantum teleportation, super dense coding, remote state preparation, quantum secret sharing, quantum cryptography, quantum internet. And these are the few things that, uh, you know, that will play a very major role in next, uh, you know, in, in next couple of years, because already we see, uh, like Chinese group, they have implemented quantum teleportation over long distance and so on. So I think these protocols will play a major role in future quantum communication. Next one. 
okay so thinking about teleportation uh, if you have seen uh, this sci-fi sci-fi movie you might have seen this fly or maybe some other star trek or something else so essentially teleportation is a process you 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 want to build a device okay where you want to send a person that means the person will enter the device and he or she will you know press a button and uh, then he will disappear from this location and they will reappear at another location and the distance is immaterial it could be another planet it could be another extraterrestrial object or something else and essentially that is the process of teleportation so if you look at the dictionary meaning of teleportation it is essentially destroying an object at one location and recreating the same object at a distant location that is the meaning of teleportation so if you ask the question can you teleport a quantum object so before 1993 it was thought that it is completely impossible why why it is impossible because to teleport what do you need for example if i want to teleport this object okay essentially what this machine had to do it, this machine had to read all the information content in this uh, person for example and then send that in information to the other end and at the other end this would have some raw material and depending on this information that the device at the other end should be able to recreate uh, you know from this uh, this whole whole object which was to be teleported okay but if you are giving a single quantum object to a person who would like to teleport that we know that he or she cannot read the full information because by no cloning theorem he is not allowed to make know the information okay he cannot make any he cannot make uh, i mean he cannot have any knowledge about the information content of this uh, quantum state if that is to be teleported so it was thought that it is completely impossible to do teleportation but but this uh, charles bennett and many other uh, people involved in that uh, paper so they found a way to teleport this quantum system so next one so here is the scheme so you have alice you have bob and alice want to teleport a quantum state to bob and uh, what she will do is that before starting the protocol they have this so called this entangled channel they have already shared this entanglement and then alice will do something on this input and this half of the entangled particle and depending on that something he will send this only two classical bit and bob will do something to this particle and at the end this particle will get transformed to the input that Alice wanted to teleport. So you see, in the whole process, Alice is not able to know what is there in the state side. Neither Bob also know what the what is the information contained in the state side. So unlike classical teleportation, this quantum teleportation is and in beautiful and amazing application of this quantum entanglement because you see this entangled channel actually somehow able to transfer all the information without even knowing what is there okay and this whole process is completely secure because if you try to tap this channel you will not know anything if you try to tap this channel you will not know anything about the state side but together if you take this quantum channel and classical channel then you will be able to recreate the states. That is the whole idea of quantum teleportation. Okay, next one. So this is the first. Uh, so the first theoretical idea came in 1993, and uh, immediately in 1997, uh, this Vienna group they did the experiment, and they could teleport the single photon over few meter across the table. Okay, that is the first uh, prototype experiment. And here you see the six scientists who discovered uh, this quantum teleportation. Next one. And subsequently, people try to uh, teleport uh, uh, information from light to matter, and then uh, they try to teleport between different objects, and so on. And they try to uh, see if you can do over long distance. Uh, and it cannot be if dropped, and uh, during the transmission of the quantum information, it can remain unconditionally secure so all these things uh, people have achieved 
Next. So this is the Denmark group with the teleportation of uh, information from photon to atom. Next one. And later on uh, in 2003, this uh, Geneva group, they teleported a uh, single photon over uh, some 55 meter. And, uh, and then uh, also they did over uh, two kilometer distance. And then the Chinese group, they also did uh, over something like uh, 16 kilometer. And Japanese group, they teleported a single photon over uh, uh, 100 kilometer in 2015. Next one. And uh, uh, two years back, this Chinese group, they reported the ground uh, breaking experiment where they teleported single photon from ground observatory to low Earth orbit satellite through an uplink channel, which is covering a distance like 1400 kilometers. This is the record breaking distance this Chinese group actually implemented quantum teleportation. And not only they did that, they also could uh, demonstrate how good that is, that they will quantify uh, up to 80%, you know, that yes, indeed it is working. Next one. So, so next quantum communication, uh, this is not really quantum communication, but this uh, tells you that even to send classical information, quantum, quantum, uh, Theory can actually help. Why? Because we know that if you want to send a single qubit, you can get only one bit. As I said in the beginning, even though quantum bit can exist both in zero and one, but once you do a measurement, you get only two possible outcomes, and that will lead only to a single bit because log base two times number of distinct outcome essentially log base two times two is just one. Okay, so essentially you get only one bit. But what happens remarkably? That was discovered by Bennett and Weisner in 1992 was that if Ellis and Bob they share entanglement, which is a kind of quantum channel, then by sending a single bit, sorry, single qubit, you can actually send two classical bit. That is why the name comes super dense coding. So this is another remarkable application of uh, quantum entanglement that not only it helps to do quantum teleportation, but also it can enhance your communication capacity, classical communication capacity. Okay, next one. So here you could tell where what I said. So you have Alice and Bob. They have this entanglement shared beforehand. Then Alice want to send two classical bit. Then she will encode this by doing something on this particle and send that particle to Bob. And Bob will do some kind of operation, and he can get only he can get two classical bit. So as I said, if they don't have this uh, this uh, entanglement just sending a single qubit, Bob will get one, only one classical bit. So that is the, that is the enhancement of, uh, um, you know, ability to send classical information using quantum entanglement. Next one. So, so unlike quantum teleportation, uh, in 2000, what I propose is something called remote state preparation, where at least want to prepare a quantum state at a distance location without physical sending it. So it is like this. Imagine that you and uh, you know you are in your home, and there is this lockdown, and uh, you want to help your friend to prepare a particular dish, okay, particular item, you know, in his or in her kitchen, okay. So what can you do? Either you can prepare your food and send it, pack it and send it by some courier, and you, you know, it will reach your friend's place, and friend can enjoy your your food, okay? Or alternately, what, what you can do is you can tell the whole preparation procedure, whole receipt over telephone, and then Bob can prepare the uh, desired dish, okay? But can this be done without these two means? That is, without telling the whole receipt, without sending the receive, prepare receive by courier, can you still do this? The answer is yes. And this is not receive, but this is, I mean, this is not uh, preparing a dish, but you know, preparing a quantum state, which I call remote state preparation, okay? So at least want to prepare a quantum state that she knows, but Bob doesn't know, 
and that she can do by again using one entanglement pair and doing something and just sending one single bit of classical information. So this idea was proposed in 2000 and also experimentally tested by many groups later on. Okay, next one. So here is the idea what I said. Alice and Bob, they are uh, at different places and Alice want to uh, help her friend, you know, so that uh, he can get this quantum state psi. So she is trying to prepare this quantum state psi, which is in her mind, okay? And that she can do by using this entanglement and using just one classical bit. Okay, next one. Uh, there is also this uh, remarkable uh, direction of you know, secret sharing, because uh, here what you want to do, you have two person Alice and Bob, and you want to have a joint account. Neither of them should have access to the account, but together they can withdraw some money. And to do that, they require a password. So think of the scenario. So Alice said this message, okay? And this is the key, okay? So neither Alice nor Bob has the key, but if Alice does this XOR operation that is additional modulo two and sends message to Bob, Bob can get the message, okay? So neither Alice nor Bob has any information, but, but together they can have the complete information. So this kind of idea people are trying to generalize, uh, it will have generalized to quantum uh, domain and uh, uh, there are many quantum secret sharing protocol where single person cannot have any knowledge about the information, but two or more number of parties can have uh, you know knowledge about the information. So next one. So there's another area that is uh, quite promising is uh, cryptography. So essentially, this is art of encrypting and decrypting message in course in order to ensure their confidentiality and authenticity. And as you know, the fundamental task of cryptography is to allow two users to have a secure communication, which is unintelligible to any third party. Next one. A typical scenario is your one-time pad. You have a plain test, you encrypt, and you send a cyber test, and then the receiver can decrypt and get the plain test. And a uh, uh, very early example of this kind of scenario is your one-time pad, or so-called cyber cipher, which you can use to do this kind of uh, you know, uh, encoding, decoding. Next one. So in quantum cryptography, uh, was proposed by Bennett and Prasad in 1984. So essentially, Alice and Bob, they want to establish a secret key. So they will have, Alice will send some quantum threat through quantum channel, and then Bob will do some random measurement. And then he, he will announce this encoding bit and, uh, you know, and then at the end, they will discard some outcome and they will end up with some secret key. Okay, next one. So quantum internet is another proposal where a lot of promise is there. And uh, essentially what you do is uh, you want to encode information, process and store in quantum node. And then nodes are connected by quantum channels that can transport qubit from site to site. And then you can distribute also this quantum bit over entire network. And at the end of the day, you could establish a quantum internet. That means you could download a quantum bit, you can download entanglement, and you can use it for quantum computation, uh, computation communication, and you can also, you know, you can uh, give it back to quantum uh, nodes also, okay? This was the idea proposed by Kimball in 1930, in 2008. Next one. So this is a better way of uh, showing what I just said. So we have some quantum node and your quantum node, you want to connect all the nodes. You can do teleportation between these nodes or you can do remote state progression. And then you can establish long distance quantum communication network. Uh, or you can also establish, uh, or you can establish some link between quantum computer a distance node also. Okay, next one. So quantum technology is actually quite, uh, quite, uh, quite vast. Uh, I just tried to highlight a few things. 
But this is a technology that is far reaching innovation based on fundamental laws of nature. So quantum information technology will make devices smaller, faster, and much more powerful than the present day electronic devices. And as I told uh, two things during my uh, presentation, uh, you can imagine starting from quantum computer to quantum software, quantum information system, quantum communication scheme, uh, like teleportation or this remote state depression or quantum internet. Not only that, also people are trying to build the uh, atomic clock, which will be having high precision and also trying to build, uh, you know, quantum algorithm for tackling hard problems and for Earth to space quantum distribution. And it, it will change nearly every aspect of future life. Next one. So quantum computing and quantum information uh, uh, is uh, not just a field where we need, you know, experts or people or scientists only from one domain. We need a multidisciplinary approach. We need people from quantum theory, we need from computer science, we need from engineering, from information theory, from communication, cryptography, from you know, many other branches we need it. So this is truly an interdisciplinary science, and that is the one of the reason why, why you know, many of the companies are uh, joining hands with uh, academia, joining hands with universities, and trying to build up teamwork to achieve their goal. Okay, this is the really, uh, really an area where everyone can put their effort and you know achieve something. Okay, next one. Next slide. Okay, so so I'm on time. So um, so here is a summary of what I said. So quantum theory, as I told in the beginning, uh, allows you to do or allows you to store information in a new way, and also helps you to process information in a completely different way, which is not there in classical domain. And also, quantum information is fundamentally different than classical information, and it exploits principles of superposition and quantum entanglement. And quantum computer can perform certain computational tasks much more faster than the classical computer part, and that is the reason why there is a global race to build quantum computer. And also I try to uh, convey you that quantum bit cannot be copied, cannot be deleted, cannot be flipped, and they cannot be masked, which means once you store information in quantum bit, they are secure at a more fundamental level. It is not that you have to, you know, you have to uh, put an extra effort in making them secure. Of course, there are other issues, but they're like, they're like issues like deep horizons and, uh, you know, uh, things like that. But uh, and a correction, but but uh, but these uh, results provide you an extra layer of security, uh, you know, uh, to quantum information that is stored in quantum bit. Okay, next one. And quantum information allows uh, a new way of communication, which I highlighted. And these operations or these uh, protocols are not possible uh, in classical world. And uh, I tried to tell you about teleportation, support and coding, remote state depression, secret sharing, quantum cryptography, quantum internet, and, uh, and there are a few more things which I have not included, but if you're interested, you can look at other protocols also. And quantum communication can allow a completely secure way of transferring information, and quantum teleportation is an important protocol that will want to make communication a long distance possible. And in all these, you will see that entanglement plays a very crucial role because that provides this invisible wiring between distant nodes in quantum communication. And one of the biggest challenge is to build, to produce entanglement over long distance, not only produce, but also you have to maintain, uh, you know, so that you can achieve your goal. And the next revolution will be quantum computing, quantum communication and quantum information technology. There is no doubt about that. So next one. I think this is my last slide. So 
today's basic science is tomorrow's technology so you see now industry you know um, private companies and everyone is interested in building quantum computer but the idea came to david dice who was pursuing pure basic science you know he, because he was a theoretical physicist he was interested in foundations of quantum theory and so on so he is the person who led the foundation of quantum computing so so this is the glaring example of the statement that what you do today in basic science is going to change future technology okay so stay motivated and if you are interested you know there are many lecture notes many online articles and uh, you know many uh, also very good textbooks you can also refer to and you can read okay thank you uh, thank you dr pati uh, no. Joel, you can please uh, switch up the presentation. Uh, well, uh, I invite all to ask their questions if they have any questions. Uh, here we already have a few. Uh, uh, the first one that we got uh, is from Dr. Pierre Vedder, uh, who asks an interesting question, Dr. Pati. He asks that uh, uh, in conventional computers, you have input-output devices uh, uh, like keypad, uh, video monitors, etc. What kind of I/O devices would be required for the quantum computer? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you know, we, we are in a situation, or we are in a uh, uh, era where we still don't know what physical system we are going to really make a scalable quantum computer. So that is not clear. So thinking about keypad and uh, monitor and things like that is. Far fetch. I still don't know. So, I mean, uh, it's too early to say something. Really, what kind of system will make out the, the, you know, like uh, what you see in classical uh, laptop or classical computer? So, and only future will tell. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have another question from Mr. Jant Ganguly who asks uh, uh, that uh, uh, how should we visualize the entanglement? Uh, what it is really? Is it something like superposition of electromagnetic waves? I mean, uh, to some extent, uh, yes, superposition do play, uh, does play uh, an, an important role because uh, what happens is uh, when you go to two or more number of particles, essentially it is the superposition of this possible combinations of uh, different states that leads to quantum entanglement. So the answer is yes, uh, superposition. So think of like this, okay? Think of two, uh, two spin-up particles, okay? So you have two electrons. So this could be up, up, both could be up, up, or both could be down, down, or this could be up, this could be down, or this could be down, this could be up, okay? But now, you see, we have also this superposition principle. That means suppose this electron is up, up, and down, down. But then we, I can also have a scenario where I will have a linear combination of this up, up, and down, down. That means alpha, up, up, plus beta, down, down. So this state is actually an entangled state. Okay? So once you create this state in your lab by some suitable uh, physical interaction or maybe some, some mechanism, then this state is actually an entangled state. And then once you create it, and you take one electron to your lab and uh, and uh, <coughs> And send another electron to my lab, even if you are in Calicut and I am in Allahabad, they will remain in entangled state. So that is the miracle of uh, this uh, quantum correlation. Uh, regarding this, if uh, I am permitted to extend this question a little bit, uh, in one place you told that uh, uh, when the entanglement is broken, you go back to the classical system once again and uh, you lose the combination and yeah. uh, have the different states uh, yeah, yeah, once yeah. more. Does it, does it mean any loss of uh, uh, information in the process? Yeah, and I is mean, there yeah. any further? Yeah, yeah, certainly. Once you do a measurement, you lose this quantum bit. So think of a single quantum bit. We don't have to go to two or more number of quantum bits. So in, you know, think of a single quantum bit, which was like, uh, say, alpha 0 plus beta 1 or alpha up plus beta down. Once I do a measurement, I get either up or down. So I lose the initial quantum state. So this is the, this is the, so that, 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 that is the reason when you do a quantum computation, uh, you try to maintain your uh, superposition till the time you know, you reach your, uh, you know, 
your target state okay the the state that you like to uh, get the final answer you have to reach, reach the state uh, and from that time you don't do any measurement once you do a measurement you lose all the benefits that you have uh, obtained so this is the kind of uh, uh, you know thing one have to be very careful in trying to implement uh, quantum algorithm yes so in such cases is there a concept of any permanent storage ah uh, permanent storage i mean as long as you can keep your quantum bit isolated you know without being uh, without allowing them to enter to the external world you can maintain but it is very hard because you know a very quantum storage is very very fragile you know i mean a slight interaction will tend to lose their uh, superposition and uh, you will lose uh, uh your initial uh, qubit so so designing a permanent uh, thing is at the moment hard but uh, you never know you know uh, maybe there is a way to shield uh, the person of one bit and they can still maintain this coherence for a long time we still don't know that so these are some of the challenging questions actually yeah okay yeah. uh we have another almost uh, parallel question from mr somesh kumar rostage who is a senior curator in our nehru science center mumbai mm -hmm. and he asks uh, if information is lost or hidden and goes to other environment mm -hmm. then uh, how to retrieve it is there any way to retrieve it further yeah good question so yes yeah, so so what we did uh, in our experiment actually we tried to do the retrieval i mean um so so in our experiment we had a single qubit and uh, we did something we did i mean apply something to this uh, quantum bit and at the end this information was lost okay but then uh, by our no holding theorem we tell us that information is not really lost it must be somewhere okay so we try to look at that where it is okay so we realized that uh, uh the the additional system which is surrounding the single qubit there are two additional quantum bits okay so we figured out that the information is not here not in first qubit but it is simply remaining in uh, one of the additional qubit so we actually re we could reconstruct the original information from third qubit so there is a way but if you are you know in this case it was a very simple system your single system is your system of interest and the additional system only two qubit to it is much simpler to handle but if you if you ask the same question in a larger context that is if you if you say this is my single qubit and i have uh, you know many many uh, additional quantum bit then uh, it may not be that easy to i mean impossibility there you know uh, the the uh, no heading theorem tells that yes inference is actually there but how to how to locate how to reconstruct from this large collection of uh, um uh, additional quantum system is very hard we still, we still don't know i mean you see in principle it is yes answer is yes it is doable but in practice uh, it may be very hard the problem may be technically almost improbable yeah. but in simpler scenario we did verify our idea and it worked perfectly it worked yes. okay then we have another question another uh cryptic question from mr gangoli mr jan gangoli he asks that if the quantum bit is uh, uh, not to be it cannot be tampered there cannot be any cloning there cannot be deletion there cannot be flipping then what is the requirement of cryptography at all no cryptography is you have to establish a secret key where this two user can have access to that they can they should be able to read your information you know this this theorem <clears throat> <coughs> sorry <coughs> these theorems provide limitation on what you can do and what you cannot do so for example uh, uh, in cryptography this no cloning theorem actually provides an additional security to uh, the information that is being sent across the channel that means suppose ls is encoding something and sending the quantum state to bob then some, somebody else cannot make a copy of your information so no cloning theorem actually plays actually provides a security to you know <coughs> quantum cryptography so So that provides the extra level, extra security. Yeah. Now, uh, from your presentation, it appears that uh, uh, developing a workable quantum computer takes a long time. Uh, even for IBM, it took some five years or even yeah, yeah, yeah. more. 
in another space what are the challenges i mean what is so difficult that uh, it's very difficult to realize in uh, actually workable form yeah so the most challenging thing uh, in building a quantum computer uh, you know in building a large scale quantum computer uh, these two things one is how to preserve this superposition for a long time that is uh, that is called coherence okay and how to uh, fight against error okay because once you have a large number of quantum bits they will try to interact with each other and then they, you know the thing that you want to encode you know there will be some extra error and that will get uh, amplified and so on so the error correction and then uh, then uh, maintaining the coherence for a long time these are two great challenge and that is the main obstacle in building or scaling of this uh, quantum computer for a large number of people so and also there is the, the other challenge we still don't know i mean currently like ibm they are exploiting only superconductivity qubit but there are other proposal like ion prob like uh, uh, photonic quantum computing like uh, nmr but we still don't know what kind of physical system will be really uh, you can scale up to say 1000 uh, number of qubit and or 2000 number of qubit we still don't know that so so these are the uh, bigger challenges we are still facing so hopefully in next 5 to 10 years something will emerge so yeah so right now if somebody uh, it might be very naive but if somebody holds uh, an aspiration that i would like to be a uh, um, person who who will work with quantum computers and all what would you suggest for them what to study and in what ways is there any particular programming language or particular forms of algorithms that they yeah, must yeah, yeah, yeah like ibm they have developed this qubit the and then uh, microsoft has its own uh, software so there are many already online and they are free available also and uh, there are many institute uh, they also teach regular courses in quantum computing quantum information like at hri we have uh, we have a regular course uh, you know and, uh, and and there are uh, opportunity to do phd if somebody wants to do phd in this area there are many okay right now i do not find any other question i only have a personal uh, Are you, are you online, Dr. Pati? I have a personal interest that I would like to ask. Uh, mm -hmm. That I remember that I uh, read some reports about your work uh, where you said that uh, the uh, quantum hiding uh, paradox that is involved in, uh, with the uh, black uh, black black holes uh, mm -hmm. uh, that can have a plausible and legitimate explanation. Uh, mm -hmm. What it is, if you would like to explain it a bit. Yeah, so uh, I mean, uh, I don't, uh, I mean, don't work too much. I mean, don't really work in black hole. But uh, my interest, uh, uh, interest actually came due to the black hole information loss paradox. When we tried to ask this question, that what happens to quantum information when it is getting lost? It is really lost, or it is going somewhere, or what is actually going on? Okay, so. So with that motivation, we try, we started this uh, question and uh, we tried to analyze. Uh, so we started actually exploring this in 2004, and it took us about uh, about uh, two almost two years to figure out the answer. So, so the no hiding theorem that I, I mentioned very briefly is actually about this. So what we prove is that if there is a physical system, you know, uh, in your uh, in your, In your disposal or at your disposal, and something happens to that, and information is lost. Okay, this is exactly what happens in black hole. So if you if you throw a pure state to a black hole, you commit all thermal radiation, and you don't get the pure state. So people say that information is lost, and there are many proposals to resolve the paradox. Some people say that maybe there is some baby universe uh, where black hole evaporates completely, it goes to some other universe and remains there, or maybe it is. It is hidden in the correlation between the inside black hole and outside radiation, and so on. So our result trying trying to prove that uh, information, if it is lost, it cannot remain in the correlation. It had to be in some other part of the universe. So so then we applied this to black hole information loss, and we ruled out one of the option that it cannot remain in the correlation. So that was the kind of implication of this no hiding.
and uh, one more last topic that i would like uh, you to cast light on is uh, mm -hmm. uh, you also have worked uh, on a field where you showed that uh, the uh, uncertainty equation of schrodinger needs some extension mm -hmm. and uh, it, it has got some other form as well mm -hmm. what about it if you may kindly explain it a little bit yeah so no very interesting i mean the question that you asked so so when you know when i was a student you know uh, in my university i always wondered um uh, ki okay is there anything beyond uh, what we know or what we are taught uh, you know in msc because in msc we all know that we have the heisenberg uncertainty relation we we learn this uh, robertson uh, you know uncertainty relation so i was thinking ki okay can can there be something else beyond this from which you can derive this you know uh and uh, that will, this is a special case of the new relation and so on so and uh, and that was you know i i was thinking and uh, trying sometime and and and, off. and in 2014 uh, myself and uh, one of my collaborator from uh, italy we figured out that yes uh, uh, it is actually possible so we tried to prove a new relation okay uh for general observables it could be position momentum it could be any two uh, observable and we found that what we have in this new relation is uh, not much stronger uh, than what uh, is there in this uh, heisenberg so so as a result the heisenberg relation that we know in textbook actually follows as a special case of that and uh, and then uh, people also did experiment and they also verified uh, so that is yes it is true yeah so that is the kind of story yes Thank okay so thank you very much uh, for uh, joining us uh, and uh, uh, keeping such a difficult thing simple <laughs> for explaining to people uh, thank you very much sir thank and uh, i yeah. hope that in future also will perhaps be some uh, chance uh, to get back to you and uh, get okay. your ideas once again okay so sure, uh, sure. yeah i need to Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so very much. So here we end this yeah, program. Yes, yes. And yes, yes, yes. take care. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. I thank all the viewers also for joining this session, and uh, I hope uh, that uh, uh, they were meaningful. And in future, if you have any questions, uh, you can come back to us. Uh, Uh, we can once again contact dr pati or we continuously work with uh, experts in different fields uh, like this uh, we will keep on working with such program thank you very much for joining uh, look forward to seeing you once again in our next programs thank you